Now let's kind of look at the integrated watch from another panoramic point that maybe you've already figured out but I really haven't covered. When you are born, I've said this part before, there's nothing. You're just an empty shell. God creates your soul and imputes it to the exiting fetus at birth if he decides that exiting fetus should contain your soul. That is when you come to exist. That is when you become a you. And that's what David is talking about in Psalm 139 verses 16 and 17. But you can't tell it in the English. Um, I'm going to have to cover that in the Hebrew later. And it kind of, this whole business about the stupidity of the pro-life people really um, focuses around what's going to be the theme of this audio, is that you have to outgrow. You start out with nothing. You grow into something. And the something you grow into is a set of false ideas and false values. You'll have some truth, but it's mostly false. And you got to outgrow it. you got to outgrow the false. In addition, and this is the hardest part that, that the Christians are also not picking up on, because they're so childish, you have to outgrow humanity. Your own humanity. See, this is what people are not spending enough time on when they talk about Christ and his spiritual life down here. They really don't know what it was like for him to be down here. You have to play with and play with and play with, you know, the Gospels and think over and think over and talk to God about those Gospel verses before you start to see this. But when I start to say it now, it ought to be like, oh, yeah, duh, obvious to you. He's God. He's man. He's one person with both natures, like you have two arms and two legs. The human nature is lower. So as a person with both natures, he has to outgrow in his soul. He has to outgrow his human nature because he's also God. He can't he can't be thinking like a human being. He can't have the standards of a human being. And, and function in his godness. He has to think and function like God, but he's doing it through his human soul. See, because the human, the soul, is where the will is located. He's one person with one will. I don't know why this was so hard for generations of stupid so-called theologians to figure out. And they still argue about it. To Christ is Christ one person with two natures or two persons with two natures or one person with two wells and therefore are you really two persons or one person? Blah, 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 blah. They're so damn dumb because their theology is childish. Their understanding of God is childish. Their understanding of the Bible is childish. Well, you have to grow past being childish. That should be obvious. As a human, you have to grow past being childish. Well, most humans don't. You also have to grow past being human. If you're going to get a kind of oneness with God that Christ prayed for in John 17, God's not you. The way he thinks and operates is not like you. And if he's God and he can enable and do anything, then he can enable this thing to work even though you're human because he did it to Christ. See, this is what people aren't picking up on. We're not born to be like we are. 
There is a an agenda. There is a learning. There is a curriculum. There is a path. There is a goal. And it isn't to be stuck with, you know, looking at each other, saying my denomination is better than your denomination, which is pretty much where Christianity sits. It's real pathetic. God 101, they're still arguing about. 2,000 years have passed and they don't understand it till yet. Of course, each side will say, well, we have the right answer. Actually, none of them do. It's really kind of sad. It was very, very disappointing for me to go through the Catholic Encyclopedia and, you know, see how childish their theology is. I didn't start out being anti-Catholic. I became anti-Catholic by learning what Catholicism is. I didn't start out being anti-Calvinist. I I became anti-Calvinist by learning what Calvinism is. I didn't start out being anti-Jehovah Witness or all those other things. I became that way by, by reading their doctrines and comparing it to Bible. And I'm like, oh my God, these people are so stupid. All of them, Lutheran, you name it. You name the denomination, it's 80% wrong and 20% vaguely right at best including all the Dispies, which is a really sad thing. The Dispies are a minority in Christendom. Dispie means somebody who basically believes that Israel has a future in pre-trib rapture. Some people call themselves dispensationalists, but they don't believe that. They're not properly speaking dispensationalists. Dispensation is an old English term. It basically means that there is a particular set of provisions for the spiritual life applicable to a certain period of time. And that that whole concept is never divorced from the fact that Israel is still owed seven years and that church goes up before the seven years begins and church comes back at the end of the seven years. Okay? That's classic dispensationalism. You know, with Paul Schofield, and I maybe mean, not Paul Schofield, but see, well, Schofield is of the Schofield Bible. I'm mixing him up with the actor. Okay. Point is that this business of integrating you has a huge upper end to it that you never hear discussed in pulpits. Because all they talk about is being moral, which, hasn't, which isn't even spiritual. If the Muslim can be moral and you can be moral, then morality is not spirituality. Duh. Okay? It really just should be that simple. Because Islam is is not even a religion. It's a terrorist manifesto. The thing is, most Muslims don't know what the Quran says. Just like most Christians don't know what the Bible says. That's why the Muslims are nice people. Because they don't know what the Quran says. Most of the imams are not like the imams in Palestine, so-called Palestine, in the Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, and in West Bank and Golan Heights, where all the terrorists live. Just that we should just nuclear bomb them, except that there would be fallout. So we should just kill them, just kill everybody that's populated there, because the children are also there to murder you. They teach their children. Go look up Hamas Bunny in YouTube. Two-year-old children, three-year-old children are taught to be terrorists. So you have to kill them all. Just kill them all. Because if you were to house one of those kids, they're already taught that they're supposed to kill you. And they will try. They will be, you know, inept at it. But that's what they think they're supposed to do. It's too late. And just know that, you know, they're too young to understand the gospel. They'll go straight to heaven, kill them. They even believe they're supposed to go straight to heaven if they die. Their own mothers strap bombs on them. You have to kill them. Just kill the whole lot of them. Why? Because they're teaching killing. So, kill them. From two years old on up. The rest of the, the, rest of the Muslim community, outside of those three places for the most part they don't know what the Quran says so they don't know that it tells you to kill people 
Okay, but they are anti-Semitic. Now, the point of all this is that the integrated whys for them are kill, kill, kill. So that's what you do to them. There's no, there's no redemption. It's not going to change. It hasn't, it's been that way for 1400 years. It's not going to change now. Okay? It just can't. That's an integrated Y in the anti-direction. That's an integrated Y in the negative direction. They started out empty too. But they were programmed by their parents. Kill, 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 kill. So by the time you're three and four years old, that's, you know, you hear the word Jew, you're supposed to kill them. You just, there, there are lots of videos on YouTube where you see this live. The, Palest the so-called Palestinians, the murderers, they're, they're, they're happy to post those videos. They're proud of their kids. Three-year-old girl stabbing with a knife, the air. What you're supposed to do to a Jew. She's got a real knife in her hand. It's like a 12-inch knife. And she's stabbing the air to show what you're supposed to do to a Jew. And her dad is recording that. Her dad is coaching her in Arabic. And she's stabbing the air what you're supposed to do to a Jew. Three-year-old girl. They're integrated. All right? That's integration in the negative direction. Integration, however, in the positive direction, again, just like that little girl who's stabbing the air, she doesn't really know what she's doing. But she doesn't know anything else. That's all she's ever going to do, is stab the air. Okay? She started out in empty, and that's what she is by the time she's three. You start out empty, and you're something else by the time you're three. Okay, but if you're learning and living on Bible... You're supposed to grow out of being 3, 5, 10, 20, 50. In your head. And you're supposed to learn to not care. And it almost sounds like, you know, Islam in a way. You're supposed to learn to not care if you're comfortable or not. You're supposed to learn to not care if you eat or not, or sleep or not. Or all those other things. This is what Paul was talking about when he says he beats the air. So that his nature won't have dominance over him. You're supposed to learn to not care if your needs are met. Even though you have needs. It doesn't mean you won't feel the need. You're supposed to. It's like a soldier. You're supposed to be willing to go on. Even though you have needs. In favor of. And this is a real kicker. In favor of something higher. In favor of what God wants. In favor of, and this is the kicker in the last stage, what the Word says. Do it for the doctrine. Do it for the doctrine. Do it for the doctrine. It matters more to you what is the doctrinal prescription for a thing than whether it feels good, than what anybody else likes. Than what you like. Of course, you know, in order to not be a weirdo, you gotta be real sure what the doctrine is. That's why this test doesn't come into the last stage of maturity. Where, you know, where your concerns and your interests have already been seated underneath. Okay. Where your interests have already been seated underneath, what does God want? It's not that there is no competition. Competition is always there. The struggle is always there. But your decision making, and it doesn't, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be 100%. Your decision making is constantly in favor of what God says. And you know what He says. It's constantly in favor of the fact that He wants it. And you know what He wants. It is an informed decision making it's not based on emotion it's not based on whether you're good or bad or right or wrong or anybody else's opinion it's based on what he says what he thinks what the word is and that matters more to you than you than your family than your health than your money than anything so now you can quickly begin to understand how this can go wrong 
Christians pretty much always talk that way when they wouldn't know enough Bible to fill a thimble. Oh, it's supposed to be God and nothing else. Yeah, but you can't even begin to live like that until you spent a whole lifetime learning and living on Bible so you know what it is that God wants, what it is that the Bible says, and you can define it. My pastor would harp on this a lot when you know when he was alive and teaching. He would say the spiritual life cannot be defined in unaccountable terms. Or cannot be accounted for in undefinable terms. That's that's what he really said. The spiritual life cannot be accounted for in undefinable terms. In other words, you can't sit there and say, "Well, God wants this." Just like the pro-lifers are so stupid. They say, "Well, God, God doesn't want abortion." Well, actually, abortion is not murder, and they're trying to claim, put words in God's mouth, and say that abortion is murder. Because they don't know the Bible. And when you show them real life Bible. And it disagrees with what they want the Bible to say. They accuse you. Those people will never mature. And those people are constantly saying. Oh I give my all to Jesus. No honey you don't have anything to give him. The only thing you got to give Jesus. Is Bible doctrine. And until you know what it is. You got nothing to give him. And if you're going to be pro-life. You'll never know it. Ever. You might memorize words, but you'll never know what they mean. Because pro-life actually is a blasphemy. It spits on God. Pro-life basically says that God is not the author of life and that we shouldn't you know, decide issues of life with respect to God, but we should go to Caesar instead. So it spits on the Word of God. It aborts the Word of God. It spits on God. It aborts God. And then calls it holy. And then says God God is behind it. It slaps God's name on it for what it wants to do. You can't be more anti-Semitic. And it is actually founded in anti-Semitism. You can't be more anti-Semitic. And you can't be more anti-God than that. But those are the people who put the cart before the horse. And they're saying, Oh, I give my life to Jesus. Many make it even a condition of salvation. Which means they're not saved. See, integration is about integrating all of your self, your motives, your thoughts, your actions, your everything, underneath God. You can't do that if you don't know Him. You can't know Him if you don't know His Word. And that takes a lifetime. So, you know... That's the other thing that Christians get wrong. They think, oh, I believe in Christ now. I'm perfect or I'm sinless or I should just go out and do great things for God. Honey, you, what you need to do is just sit down and shut up. Sit down and learn the Word of God. Learn all those words in that book and why are they there? Why are they what they are? And learn them in the Hebrew and the Greek or you ain't learning it. And you say, well, that takes a long time. Yeah. To Christ, 30 years going to take you a while this is you know it really just ticks me off he spent 30 years doing what we don't know why don't we know because it's not relevant clearly by the time he starts talking and we find out about it at age 30 in Matthew 4 He's got the word just constantly on his brain. In fact, he says so, Matthew 4.4. 4. You don't live on bread. You live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, well, there are a lot of words that proceeded from the mouth of God. Do you know them? And I don't mean can you memorize them and spout them back. Do you understand what they mean and why they're there? I don't know a Christian who does. I know some Christians who are beginning to. My pastor, of course, knew. But I don't know anybody who studied under him. Well, maybe one person, two people, who actually understood what he was talking about. That's sad. And all those other teachers, 
I'm sure some of them are good, but I haven't heard any. You can say, well, right out, that's not fair. Okay. Prove me, prove it wrong. Because they're all talking about working and being moral. They're not talking about integration of your soul and your thought and your thinking with God's Word. That's an entirely different agenda from being moral. It has absolutely nothing to do with people. You're going to open up your refrigerator in the morning. That's an opportunity to integrate with God. Well, what should I have for breakfast? It's not about being legalistic. It's not about morality. It's not about a rule or law or anything else. It's like, gee, well, I, what does God think about what's in my refrigerator? This is an opportunity to use Bible doctrine to decide what I'm going to eat for breakfast. Why wouldn't you want to take advantage of that? Somebody who wants God would want to. Somebody who views the whole idea of relationship with God as something you do in order to be a good person. They'll never be spiritual. If you're doing what you're doing with your relationship with God in order to be a good person, you don't have a spiritual life. It is it is not. It's not a spiritual motive. See what I mean by integration? I want to eat breakfast based on what God likes. Because it's an opportunity to have a dialogue with him. Because it's an opportunity to make something stupid breakfast. Have a higher, better value. See, higher, beyond human value. So, hey, Dad, I'm opening up my refrigerator. What should I eat? And his answer, at least with me, is always what's good about it, what's bad about it. He wants me to practice that because I hate it. And, well, this is what's good about it. This is what's bad about it. But it's an opportunity to have a conversation with him. Instead of merely just eating breakfast, a low human thing. See the difference? That has nothing to do with morality, does it? It has to do with living on a higher plane of existence and everything else is subordinated to the conversation. That's an integrated why. That's how life in heaven will be. You know, a lot of us, and I, I was thinking about this the other day too, I wonder, you know, what's it going to be like once we're dead? What is heaven like? And to a certain extent, there's a, a fear that's going to be boring because it sounds to us like, well, if we're all perfect, there's going to be no struggle, no conflict, no nothing. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have friends? Of course you do. Do you have family? Of course you do. Do you have a job? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Do you have your favorite TV shows? Of course you do. Now, when you're engaged in activity with... Oh, and your favorite foods. Of course you've got favorite foods. When you're eating your favorite foods or talking to people you enjoy being around... Or watching your TV favorite show, or being around your favorite relatives, or being around your favorite friends, and doing your favorite activities at work. Don't you kind of have, you still have pull and push and tug. You still have some kind of struggle going on, but you love it. What do you do with people that you like? Well, you talk. You don't necessarily agree. You play games, and it's not always, you know, you don't always win when you play the games. You go uh, out on walks, you see the environment, you go to a game, and that's, you know, two sides playing against each other, and one wins, but there's still struggle. When you make a meal, there's still a struggle of making the meal. When you build a house, there's still a struggle making a house, but you're glad to have that activity. Well, that's the way heaven is. It's a lot of activities, a lot of struggle, because we're all going to be different, but you like it. And it always has some kind of goal that you're going to reach at some point. 
and you're going to love the entire process of where you are now to reaching that goal. That's why it's called heaven. In order for that to occur, there has to be some kind of growing up into the standards and thinking of God himself so that you can enjoy all the activity of heaven with those who grew faster than you or more than you and those who grew less than you. That's why the struggle remains. There's always going to be a struggle. There's always going to be a challenge. You're going to get up if we go to sleep at all. I'm, I get this sense that we don't sleep. But there's always going to be some kind of rest period. There's always going to be some kind of work period. There's always going to be a play period. There's always going to be a vacation period. There's always going to be some kind of celebration or parade period. And there's always going to be education. Yeah, pretty much the way things are now. Except ideal. So there's always going to be a struggle. There's always going to be somebody that you're going to be helping to learn him better. Or to learn X better. There's always going to be somebody helping you to learn X better. That's part of the work part. Or the education part. Or maybe even the vacation part. There's always going to be struggle. So to the extent that you can elevate your daily activities into, okay, Dad, what do you think about this? What Bible doctrine comes to bear on this? To that extent, you're raising the, the bar of what you want out of life. You're raising the bar of your own motives in life to be, where's do it for the doctrine. Do it because of what he likes. Because you want to. Not because you're human and you need it. Not because someone tells you and you ought to do it. But because of something higher. Something better. And then all the other motives, they're, they're not invalid. They just have lesser validity. They're more childish. They'll all sort out underneath. And you practice it over and over and over like piano. Now practicing piano is the example, but I could say practicing ballet, practicing shooting baskets. I mean, when you're practicing something, there is a very real component of practice that's dull and boring and repetitive. And you do it over and you do it over and you do it over. But the reason why you do it over is because you want to. And you're doing it for some higher reason than merely the practice. You believe in it. What you're really doing is you're, you're, you're integrating. That's what practice does. Practice integrates you. And talk to any baseball player, basketball player, piano player, lawyer even. You practice it over and over and over and over so that you get a skill. Skill is the result of practice. And what it is is an integration between your mind, your will, and the activity that you're doing. Okay? You're, you're integrating everything together. So it's kind of like the game Mousetrap from the 1970s. You, you roll the dice and roll the dice. And that gives you the ability to put the parts together. And at the end, you put the ball on it. goes all the way to the end. And it's cute to watch. But all the pieces got built. And they integrated together. That's the objective of spiritual life. Is to integrate you with God so that you can enjoy your future in heaven, seeing Him integrated in everything. And of course, most people won't. They'll, they, they believe Jesus Christ paid for their sins for a nanosecond during their life, and then they forgot about it or got all kinds of false doctrine added on. So once they're dead, it'll be the first time they actually begin to see God for Himself. And it'll be maybe a hundred million years before they learn in their more stunted way 
because compared to you, it will be more stunted. Maybe a hundred million years before they learned what you learned in one lifetime down here. That's scary. Because once you die, you have fixed your thought pattern. And if that thought pattern doesn't have Bible running it, and I don't mean memorizing it, I mean understanding it, integrating it with God himself. If you haven't done that by the time you're dead, well then you're going to have to learn how to do that. And you set in stone your thought pattern and you're stuck with it and it makes you smaller your soul can shrink or it can grow if it shrinks then the amount that you can process of information about him once you're dead is really small so it has to go over and over and over and over a lot more than it would have to down here because you got the full power of the Holy Spirit down here with the full potential still remaining down here. Now maybe that isn't exactly a 100% correct explanation of the problem, but definitely your ability to process information about God in heaven is restricted to whatever Bible doctrine you learned down here. And whatever you got instead that you spent your time on, that will be in the way. You won't want that. So the ultimate integrated why is to integrate your life now based on, well, what does he think and what does the word say? And you really, the best and highest and most enjoyable attempt, even if it feels bad, reason to live is because of what God thinks. Rather than, oh, it's five o'clock and I'm tired. Oh, well, let's just open up some noodles and eat those. See the point? You can live low or you can live large. Integration is about learning to live large. His idea of large. That's what happened to Christ on the cross. That's what Paul is talking about. That his soul got enlarged. That's what the book of Hebrews is telling you in Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4. His soul got enlarged. The the effect of our sins lacerating him enlarged his soul so much so that it, as some theologians try to argue, he fused. F-U-S-E-D. I'm not sure that's the right word, but that's a word that Watchman Nee kind of liked to use, although I think his favorite word is mingling, where he uses an example of milk and tea. And then my pastor was sort of talking in the same way, trying to explain, well, you know, at post-cross, it's all, he's all, it's all one. There's, there's no separation. Okay? And I'm not sure that's even true. But the point is, is that there's nothing, the, the soul is not a barrier to his godness. The throughput, the whole, his soul size, whatever it needed to be, is big enough so that there's no restriction on his godness as throughput. Now you've heard me do integrated throughput, so you should know what I'm talking about now. Well, the throughput at the other end of the Christian who, you know, either got into religion or just believed and said goodbye God, I'll see you in eternity, either one. Well, they entered, they, they entered the heaven with like a pea-sized soul. And that's the size it stays. What's the throughput? Now, maybe you can argue, well, wait a minute, are you sure it stays that small size? Maybe not, but it doesn't grow fast if it starts out that small. So, you know, what do you want out of life? And even if those things, all of what I've said so far is not true, wouldn't it be better than just to get up bleary eyed in the morning? What kind of grape, what kind of cereal should I eat? You could ask God and say, well, what would be good for breakfast, Dad? What would you like? And then you're eating based on a conversation with Dad. Instead of bleary eyed. You see the difference? 
It's integrated wise. It's all about living on a higher plane. And all of your typical Christians, and certainly, of course, the Muslims, because they're all talking about left hand that you wipe with. You don't even get to use toilet paper. That's their idea of holy. Okay? And the Christians, I'm sorry, aren't much better. Counting beads, the color of robes, chanting, being moral. All those things are low life. That's low to the ground, looking at each other, oh, comparing ourselves by ourselves. Yeah, and Paul said that's not wise. It's certainly not spiritual. So turn it into spiritual. Hey, Dad, what should I eat for breakfast? Think about it. 